please give it up for Aunty Jenny Munro. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, pleasure to be here, dear, as usual. Um, I probably want to start uh, with Riggy Dick, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Um, I was the administrator um, when it was first um, held in, oh, God, 88, 90, 91, a uh, long time ago. Two babies too, mind you. But... Um, the thing I think I need to ask you all is when you count the number of deaths between uh, the, the 99 that we looked at in uh, late 88, 90 and the 500 since that have gone without a, uh, a whisper from White Australia from the correctional services, that's um, 600 people in 40 years. Why is that not a national disgrace? that we've lost so many in a jail system in, um, you know, 40 years. You really need to ponder that long and deep, I think, before you understand what comes next. If our lives mean so little um, to the servants of the state, and that's what they are, what does our lives mean to the rest of the people in this country that have came unannounced, uninvited, to our land to continue the institutions that were set up by the people that came to steal and murder and rob. That was their um, deliberate decision back in 1788. They, they called it terra nullius, vacant land, remember? We did not exist. We weren't allowed to exist. We weren't allowed to be because they had another idea for this place that was our paradise before they turned it into hell. It was a beautiful place before white people came here. And you only really have to look at any of the history books about our culture and our knowledge and our law to understand that. I'm related to animals in this system. I'm related to this boy in this system. That's our bloodline. Paul has the same bloodline, Felon has the same bloodline. We are connected to country, by country, for country. I, my river, and I'm so proud of it, it's one of the coldest rivers in the country. Sister girl, I want to take you up there and throw you in that water because it is not only a river, it's our supermarket, it's our church, it's our school. It's all the things that we had on those riverbanks before white people came and destroyed it. Maliciously too, not, you know, there's no need for it. Of course there was a great need for it. It was a vital part of, of our life, um, a core of our beings for most of us. Um, I still worship in my river. I go home, I have an ear, a growth in my ear from swimming in the cold water, but I will not stop swimming in that cold water. Now, I think we need to come back to the question I asked first. How does 600 deaths by the hands of police, and some of them footage is much more violent than we saw with young David, and that was tragic enough, but, you know, people being hung in cells. I'll repeat a little bit of history from um, after, just after 1788 when our warriors like felons stood up and fought, they killed them, not one or two, many, many, and they beheaded them and put their heads on, spear, on the top of spears as a warning to the rest of our people. This is what will happen to you if you resist, if you oppose, if you say something different than the narrative that these people are giving. We have had death as a constant companion since 1788. There's not a time, there is not a time in our lives when death doesn't stalk us. We, use, we lose babies when they haven't even learned to speak because of the racism that's so endemic in this country. We, use our, we lose our young boys because they, maybe mother being... Um, you know, a little bit naive, said, you stand up and fight, 
or I'll flog you when you get home. You know, we taught our kids to be strong and that strength is what brightens white Australia. All the time it is what frightens white Australia. It's why we have been given a number for extinguishment a long time ago. Why laws written in this country, and I mean the Native Title Act, is all about extinguishment of title, all about that connection, that crux to country. I have totems, bird totems. We all have bird totems, all our tribes, okay? Mine's eagle and crow. And then I have family totems, brown snake, sand goanna. Okay, now they are both represent my family on just one side. But that's just part of the connection we all as Aboriginal people have to our country. And that's, if you understand a relationship between an animal as your brother and sister, you begin to understand what we're talking about, what we all feel as Aboriginal people because that, even though white people have been controlled the history books and tried to control the knowledge that they taught, we know in our history that knowledge before they got here. So that is the important thing for us to continue what we were taught by our old people, even more so now when it is under such attack and such threat by this wider racist system that is embedded here on our land. I actually call Australia a dead nation because it is a dead nation. It has no heart pumping. Um, that's probably just adrenaline if you think you hear a heartbeat. It's not. It's a dead nation because it has been created by people that lied, that murdered, that massacred. Like I said, the example of our warriors being beheaded and their head put on a spear as a warning to the rest of us. What sort of psychological trauma do you think that's going to cause? Why do you think we are as we are today? Because we have suffered generations of it. You know, I'm counting eight, nine, ten generations at least from 1788 and the way our mob breed is probably more like 15, 16 generations. <laughs> but that's... I mean, you can't take it out of us in 16 generations. You ain't going to take it anywhere. It's there. It's part of the blood that flows through us. It's part of that DNA that, you know, it's like it's like those animals in the country. You want the country but you don't want us. You know, you, you froth at the mouth for the country. The greed is one of the great evils that were born here in this country to our land in 1788. Our people did not monopolise things. We shared. That was the culture of our people, to share everything, food, water, whatever you had to sleep with. We shared. That was our culture of inclusiveness and we still do it today when we have nothing to share. It's that deepness and richness of connection that you can't <laughs> pretend or say it comes from somewhere else or a place that over, over the bonny waters, you know, in, in good old London town. No, I'm sorry, but they were depraved and dark and evil before they came to our shores. Just look at the, the way they treat their own children. Sent them away. You don't even want to look after their own children. I mean, you call that a mother? No, I don't. I call it something else. Certainly not a woman either. Uh, you know, you have your children to nurture them and rear them and grow them and teach them. Not, oh, you're a commodity I can send over to the other part of the world and not have to worry about you until you're 21, 22 or something and then you come back and be my worst nightmare. You know, the attitude to family is different. The attitude to land is different. The attitude to everything we have is different. Because of that longevity here, we can look at our totem and wonder what their life is like. We can look at our brother and sister and wonder what their life is like, especially the fair ones. Because if you thought that they got it easier, no, they didn't. 
It was actually worse for the fair-skinned ones. You can see, I don't have to, you know, you don't got to look at me to see what I am. I ain't white. And I'm not an approximation of whiteness anywhere, anyway. And as soon as I open my mouth, anyway, that's, that idea is going to be given short shrift. I have had the privilege to grow up in a family with a man called Paul Coe as the eldest of the siblings. Now, if you've watched ABC in the last couple of nights, you might have saw something about the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in 1972 that they set up in Canberra. And if you look at that footage, you can certainly see very clearly who the leader of that movement was back then, and it was Paul. His intelligence, his scathing disregard for the <laughs> this day to night, the television programs, that look in his eye, now, that's what I call resistance, and it was embodied in people like my brother. And I had the privilege, and my sister Isabel too, I had the privilege of being the third after them. So Paul first, Isabel second, then me. And then two more after us. That made up the five children of our family, Mary and young Les. So, you know, growing up with that intelligence around you, it kind of, it had to rub off, I think. Well, I hope. Uh, uh, you know, and I think you only have to listen to how he articulated it um, in that little bit of stuff and a lot of the um, the footage was mucked around with the ABC stuff last night. You, you miss seeing people like Aunty Shirley Smith who was our matriarch back then in the 70s, my grandmother's sister. Um, you missed um, the – where um, I'm – they came, when they moved in on the embassy and uh, took it down, I was actually assaulted and Paul came to my rescue and said so he was badly assaulted and sent to hospital. Uh, they just jumped on him. That was in a, the reason that they needed and the excuse that they had to target Paul at the time. And he's been a constant target for all of his adult life because of um, he was instrumental in setting things up like the Aboriginal Legal Service. And um, it's not perfect, but it's been one of the best bulk works we've had against the racism in the system and dedicated lawyers that have learnt and come along and come to understand through just observation what it's like to be black in your own land with a foreign power telling you you own nothing. We own it all. Doesn't matter how many governments come, doesn't matter. They speak with the forked tongue, as our Native American brothers would say. They lie all the time, not some of the time, all of the time. You can even get a priest that you can find, it'd be very difficult, that don't lie. And that's sadly the indictment on their society, not ours. We are a people that yearn more than anything else to go back to those days when we had no white intervention. I mean, I've probably been na in my nastier moments and said, build a fleet, send them back. I don't think anybody's going to listen to me there, so we're going to have to find another compromise that works for all of us, not just some of us. And that compromise is to know and understand the nature of the place you're at. You're on our land. You need to start giving real respect to what ownership of this oldest living culture and law on the planet means. We didn't get to be the oldest through mistakes. A big, big part of being the oldest was being isolated, an island in the Southern Ocean <laughs> that they weren't really interested in until they ravaged everything in, in Europe and the Northern Hemisphere and part of the Southern Af Hemisphere with Africa and other places like the Americas. Um, you know, we have a system of religion. We have a family of gods. Bayami is the main patriarch of the gods. Bayami has a wife. He has 
brothers and sisters. He has children. They're all up there in the sky. You see them at night, every night. And there's even by army up there in the sky watching us every night. A star system called by army. So he watches us night and day. Um, he cried many tears over what's happened, the injustice in our own land. Um, cried many times for the murders and the massacres of us. We don't even know the body count of how many people were killed in those killing times. And they are today still killing times. That hasn't changed. How many of those um, 600 people that were killed, their lives that were cut short by a police officer, that police officer, not, not one charge. Don't. Am I the only sane person or am I the only crazy person in the room? I'm not sure most of the time because the, the way the system is made and geared, is, it'll just roll over us. I'm 67. Okay, 17 when I was at the embassy. Do the math. So I started my journey of advocacy and activism and radicalism as a 17-year-old. So you got to step up, man. I want, I want to hear about what you're doing in about 50 years or what you've done. But we have all learnt from the activists that came before us. I learned a lot from Aunty Shirley. I learned a hell of a lot more from my grandmother. And I learnt a lot, lot more again from my mother. And that's with all of our families. And when they are intact, nothing more powerful on the planet. We know things in this country that are magic and mysterious and will amaze you when you hear about it. A lot of you would live in New South Wales, for example. Do you know in the northwest of New South Wales there's a river that runs both ways? Not many people know about that, but the locals do. Probably one of their best kept secrets. So I'll get hit up the mush by some old girl for telling <laughs> you fellows about it. But these are the sort of magic things that happen here. Uh, you know, summertime now. Anybody going out in the rural areas, you that want to come swimming, watch the ground. Watch the ground. Not because of the stones but because of the mm, mm, mm. <laughs> They're going to come and bite your ass <laughs> and they're venomous. So, you know, you mightn't get back up after that bite. So you've got to watch the ground first and that's one of the things we'd learn <laughs> very young, in summertime in particular when they're out. And this time of the year when they're breeding. So, you know, just <laughs> when you're running down to the riverbank, don't just, oh, oh, trip, trip, down. Watch the ground every step of the way. And then you might be able to have a dive and get wet and have a swim and get out. Otherwise, you'll just, you know, you got a, you got a puncher in your leg somewhere and we don't know what happened until they pull you out. And that other fellow that Paul was talking about, that coroner, he gets to have a look at you. <laughs> we have systems of law that are deep and complex and rich. Our old people, our young people learn that system from the time they're babies. Um, I have two sisters. We had, um, we shared tit duty with our kids. So if my sister couldn't, uh, had to do something, I had Raymond on one side and Murray on the other, or Nyoka and Malika. So that's what we did. Those are the sort of things we do in our culture. That's what you call allied. I even put my baby on my sister's tit and walk away, knowing that she's fine until I get back. And that's as pure as sisterhood can be as pure as motherhood can be. And the men do the same when they go through and teach our boys our law, our system. The knowledge is imparted and it is to be used wisely. 
because if you use it wrong, you won't be an elder and you won't be a young boy enjoying the pleasures. You'll be somebody who's got to be <coughs> until you learn. Now, you know, like I said, that, that's just discipline. But we've had to learn how to fight to survive. And I, look, I fought a lot of young women in my young years. None of them came back for round two. But that's just how we were taught. You don't, you're going to do this thing, you do it properly. And you're going to knock them down, you knock them down so they don't get back up. So, you know, it's just one of the things we were learned to do well. <laughs> and some of us do it better than others. <laughs> These are the survival techniques that we've had to, to learn and pass on to each other to survive white Australia because we have relished in black Australia for thousands of years. You know, I'm, I'm still interested in the body counts from the massacres. Will we ever know how many people were killed? Do we have a guess? How many thousands do you think that would be if it was 600 people in 40 years here now? And that's just the ones in jail. Remember that big point because a lot, a lot more murders that happen outside of jail, people aren't convicted or the wrong people are convicted. There is a serious flaw in this um, criminal system and it's, it's a flaw that goes right through the heart of the whole system. Not your law. You know, it's not your country. You should not be forcing that law onto our people. We have laws. They do us very well. Thank you very much. Go away with your Westminster. That's all it is. How one people brutalised another people to get what they wanted. No new recipe there. You know, what we've got to learn to do is be able to live together, find the similarities, the humanness that makes us like each other. I mean, not physically too. Hey, you're my man, like, I mean, to be like one another. So, you know, you can still learn every day and our babies teach us more than anyone else every day just through their interactions with each other. Uh, you know, when you have little kids that are <laughs> talking politics from the time they're five or six or seven, what do you think they're going to be doing with politics by the time they're in their 20s? Young man, you taking notice? <laughs> And the young fellow over here too, he's got a long way to go, but he is shining a, a shining light at the moment because he's shown something, a light on the depravity that happened with his uncle. Now anybody that watches that and doesn't cry doesn't have a heart. Um, and if you don't have a heart, you really need to be in your... Um, um, grave, because you're dead and you don't know it. Uh, embassy, I wanted to tell you a good story about the embassy. When we talked about um, Queensland and the Apartheid Act, we're down there in Canberra in probably the 80s. Yeah, I don't think I was pregnant in the 80s too. Uh, uh, and it was all about the Queensland, the Act in Queensland now, the our people have um, slogans, you know, sayings, um, mantras that we have when we have marches, you know, like land rights, you know, and land rights now, what do we want, when do we want it? I hear that coming back from me, to me from around the world, what do we want, when do we want it? But um, 1982, uh, the Queensland Apartheid, we were down there in Canberra uh, protesting about it. Now the, the, the rally and the cry was... Um, Free the Blacks, smash the act. Now, of course, I'm, I'm still on my um, radical pea plates back then, you know, and we only had it for about 10 years. So I've, I've got the megaphone on the side and I'm smash the Blacks, free the act. So they took that megaphone off me real quick. <laughs> you got it the wrong way, you right back. I said, well, you should have told me what it was. I mean, I just sort of, you know, I'm deaf now, so free the... Free the black, smash the act. <laughs> smash the act, free the black. 
Uh, but that was just one, in, you know, one story. There are many others. Uh, uh, if you're an older person before um, uh, Redfern or the block became the meeting place, Victoria Park was the meeting place. <laughs> now, Billy Craigie. If you've seen a lot of the embassy stuff, uh, was my brother-in-law's founder. Uh, and Isabel, if you haven't heard of her, it's my sister, Isabel Co. Well, that's where they uh, became friends. Isabel was being harassed by some men down there at night and little Bill jumped up to the rescue. What the fuck's going on here? So Isabel fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> So he's my brother-in-law, Billy, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the the things that Billy and his, oh, man, he was the best person in the world at one-liner comebacks, you know, oh, had 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 it down pat. Uh, if you watch some of that embassy footage, you might see some of it, but you really had to know the man to know <laughs> his warped sense of humour, uh, you know, and, I think a lot, you know, what would they be thinking now, the ones that have left us, that are gone, Billy? Uh, you know, there's only um, Paul and um, he has serious um, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, Bowley, which I actually, um, I have to apologise to him because when I, when I, I was at the embassy in 72 and they moved in on us, I saw Gary get on a bike and ride off around the corner, but the other footage shows him being thrown into the police van. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things. I think there were many, many romances started up in Victoria Park. I can tell you a lot of families, a lot of bloodlines come through that park up there. <laughs> uh, bloodlines, people that met down there in Canberra. Uh, people from other parts of the country, um, uh, like the Queensland people when we went up there for the <laughs> demo, 82. Uh, I worked as the CEO of the um, Nails when they did the Royal Commission, so I had inside information or inside knowledge about that whole pro process. Um, uh, it was probably one of the most trying we used all the field officers that were trained at the legal service previously um, and they visited every jail and spoke to every black prisoner in the country at the time. So, uh, And I think they uh, did a monumental job. Um, our report probably wasn't mentioned in the Royal Commission report because we um, didn't get it in in time, but we know we did it. We know they did the job. Uh, and that was just typical of the white system, not even wanting to listen to Aboriginal people anyway and issues that directly affect us. Still happens today. Voila. Uh, uh, and the problems, are, you know, these problems will remain while ever white people are arrogant enough to think they have the right to make decisions for and on behalf of us. And that arrogance has been here for as long as white people have been here. And don't take this personally. I know sometimes it sounds like it's personal attack, but it's not. It's just a critique on what came on the system we have now. Um, it's, it's by far um, inferior to our system of law by, by I don't, any parameter that you want to measure it by. Um, personal well-being, look at the, the sickness and poverty in our people because we are denied even the right to live by our own law in our own country. The sickness that brings to people, the sickness that brings the country, the sickness that brings to the animals, the rivers, you know, all of it. You know, we have all of these, um, you know, the bad guys now are the coal seam gas miners, you know, and the, uh, these, these were part of life of this country for a very long time. The, the uh, rape of the resources and the mineral wealth of our country made a lot of white people rich on our land. Well, we were still, uh, you know, I've told my kids for years, we, are, we should be the billionaires, not the beggars in our own land. Well, that's what I want to overturn the system. When I'm the billionaire and I see the people that have had privilege all of their life having to beg for a meal, that's when I'm going to say, finally, we've got justice. There's nothing that white people can say or do really can 
articulate how we um, know ourselves. Um, you know, sometimes I think I'm crazy. Sometimes I think I'm brilliant, but most of the times I think I'm just ordinary. Uh, uh, that's human nature. You know, it's the nature of the beast, the nature of the being. But what the nature of the beast needs to be this cruelty, this madness that says I can kill you because you, you have something I want. That's what's got to stop. This, this need uh, to acquire things that aren't yours. We, our people are happy, you know, to live in those humpies. We, we don't, we like a mansion but we don't need a mansion, you know. That's the difference. You fellas need the mansion. You know, you need to learn to like it before you need it. And that's the difference. Um, we will continue to struggle. Our fight, uh, you know, we still, I think we still do pretty good at bringing up the young fellas to learn how to be radicals. I can see a young mate here <laughs> looking at me. Uh, but that's how I looked at Aunty Shirley and that's how I looked at a lot of the old people that taught me, um, you know, my um, grandmother. Uh, one of the most beautiful women in the world. And she um, had one leg shorter than the other and used a crutch all her life. But I only had to snuggle into her sussies and I was in heaven. You know, that's all. Uh, and that's, these are the little things that mean so much to us, you know. It's not, I got a billion dollars in my bank, I'm richer than you. Oh, you got two billion in your bank. I'm just going to get your account number and take the lot out, which I would call justice too. You know, all these millionaires that have made money, uh, the Twiggies, whoever else has made money, who now wants to go green, my God. You know, <laughs> all that iron ore and now he's going green. They're amazing, aren't they? You need to understand we've lived with it in the, uh, you know, if we've been here for as long as we say we've lived through at least two ice ages, okay? That's enough common sense for you to know that when we do possum skin, <laughs> it's because it's very warm in the winter. <laughs> you know, it wasn't because, oh, this looks nice. No, it's because it's very warm and if you walk around with nothing, none other than a bit of cloth, <clears throat> you shiver. Yeah. Common sense, our people have more common sense oozing out of their toenails than most other people have. And that's just because of observation over a very long period of time, again. You can't get it wrong if you can, if you can't get it wrong if you keep on observing what's been done right. And what's been done wrong in this country has been done for 250 years. We need to start making doing it right and doing it right is recognising that our law is the oldest law on the planet, oldest law in this country and certainly needs to be given more respect, more acknowledgement and actually be legislated as the law of this land because that's a lie when you say the British law is the law of this land. I think I might stop there. Uh, uh, uh. Hello. <laughs> Where am I? Lachlan.